Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you do offer us living water welling up to eternal life. And we pray for the help and inspiration of your Holy Spirit as we reflect together on this encounter between you and the Samaritan woman. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So I wonder, have you ever been really thirsty? Probably there are times when we've all felt a bit thirsty and longed for a drink. I think my worst experience was when waiting for an operation. I was told not to drink after midnight, admitted for a minor off at 7am, and then I wasn't operated on until 3.30pm. I was really thirsty. I became so thirsty I couldn't think about anything other than water. It became an obsession. And what joy there was when I woke up from the operation to have those first few sips of water. And then even an NHS cup of tea was wonderful. <laughs> and another place we could feel thirst is in the heat of the desert, where it is possible, isn't it, to experience life-threatening dehydration. By the way, what's the best thing to take to the desert? A thirst aid kit. Why did the explorer say when he found water in three different places in the desert? Well, well, well. That's it. The climate of Palestine especially, away from the coastline, can be hot and dry at times. And occasionally, Sirocco winds bring intense heat. In biblical times, maintaining an adequate water supply for human and animal consumption, as well as for agriculture, was a problem. People knew about physical thirst. But we use the word thirst sometimes as a synonym for a strong desire or a craving, like a thirst for knowledge, or a thirst for wealth, or a thirst for God, a spiritual thirst, if you like. And the latter is what our passage in John particularly addresses. And isn't this a remarkable encounter and a wonderful example of Jesus surprising people by his words and actions? Samaria lay between Galilee in the north, Judea in the south. The most direct route from Galilee to Jerusalem was through Samaria, but there was animosity. animosity. The Jews and the Samaritans didn't get on. And sometimes there were groups that even attacked Jewish um, travellers. Many people, therefore, avoided that route and went via Jericho. But Jesus didn't. He went from Judea to Galilee via Samaria. And he and his disciples arrived at Sychar. Jesus sends his disciples off for food. There he is, alone by the well, Jacob's well. And a Samaritan woman comes along. And he engages her in conversation. This was not the done thing. The disciples, when they return, you may recall, were surprised. Any respectable male Jew would have walked away and completely ignored the woman because it was taught that a man should not be alone with a woman or talk to a woman outside of the home just in case his reputation was harmed or he was drawn to immoral thoughts or even actions. But this woman in particular, even worse in some ways, had a dubious reputation and was avoiding people by coming to the well in the heat of the day. But Jesus did not shun her. Samaritans were also despised by the Jews because they're of mixed heritage. They built their own temple and Jews thought they might contaminate them if they got too close. Certainly drinking from the same vessel was not on. But you know, to Jesus, none of this counted. People mattered much, much more. So Jesus begins the conversation with a simple request, asking for a drink. The woman was surprised, maybe even shocked, but perhaps it was just a little bit affirming and reassuring too. And as the conversation progresses, Jesus is able to offer this woman living water, welling up to eternal life. 
Now, of course, at first she doesn't understand, and there's an amusing exchange between them, isn't there? Because Jesus is offering what will satisfy all thirst, but all the woman can respond is, hey, you don't have a bucket, how can you do this? <coughs> Gradually, though, the light dawns on her. This isn't an ordinary man, this is a prophet. He knows about her living with a man after several marriages. And he's offering something a bit different. Is this the Messiah? And she's so excited that she will abandon her water jar and go and tell everyone about the Messiah. You see, human beings were created for a relationship with God. Without that, we can feel empty inside. That's what the woman needed. She needed God. And that woman was isolated too. She was isolated from other people. But she must have felt estranged from God because of her lifestyle. So the idea of living water excited her. Now maybe we too sometimes feel far away from God for all sorts of reasons that we could sum up as life and lifestyle. But we need to pause and recognise there's an emptiness and a thirst for a relationship with God sometimes. Have we got so complacent as well that the thought of living water doesn't excite us anymore? <coughs> well, what most people, and probably nearly all of us here, have tended to do is, yeah, sometimes we feel a bit empty and then we try and do it our own way. We fill the gap with other things. Lent is an opportunity, though, to reflect on what might be preventing us from recognising our spiritual thirst, the need that only God can fulfil. For when God does satisfy our thirst, we can enjoy life's pleasures to the full, but we're not dependent on them and they won't harm us or others. Living independently from God does tend to lead to unhappiness and pain in one way or another. You know, the writer George Bernard Shaw was a brilliant man, but he had early on rejected the message of scripture, refused to drink the living water. He couldn't find lasting inner peace though, and slowly lost confidence in his own beliefs. Shortly before he died, he wrote, the science to which I pinned my faith is bankrupt. Its councils, which should have established the millennium, have led directly to the suicide of Europe. He's of course referring to the Second World War and its aftermath. I believed in them once. In their name I helped to destroy the faith of millions. And now they can look at me and witness the great tragedy of an atheist who has lost his faith. Contrast that, though, with some of the stuff we find in the Bible, looking at the Psalms, perhaps. David's passion for God and his certainty that no matter what, God will be there for him. Psalm 42, verse 1, is something that we probably all relate to. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. So we recognise our need for God and then we believe and trust that Jesus will provide what we need. And then, as the Romans passage explains, we will have reconciliation with God. We can be adopted into his family, confident of his love, his care, his grace and his mercy. And sometimes the Holy Spirit is described as water in scripture. We have in John 7 that very thing. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And John adds this, in case we don't understand. By this, Jesus meant the Spirit, whom those who believe in him were later to receive. Jesus promises us, the Holy Spirit, to come and to dwell in us, and he will satisfy our thirst for God. Jesus knew all about the needs of the woman at the well, but he knew all about her lifestyle too. 
And Jesus knows all about us. I mean all about us. It's a bit scary, isn't it, to think that he knows the innermost secrets of our hearts. But you know, he understands. He gets the mess we get into sometimes. He knows how we've got there. But wonderfully, amazingly, he still wants to be with us. He still wants to pour his love into our hearts. He wants to reach out to us and hold us and welcome us. Soon we will come to take communion, and as we eat the bread and drink the wine, we will be nourished through Jesus. As we eat and drink, we are receiving the life-giving water, the water of eternal life that Jesus offers all who are thirsty. Come to communion thirsty to meet with Jesus. And of course, there are many other ways to be nourished, Bible reading and prayer, worship, and even times of silent communion with the Lord. Take time to be with him. Find ways to be refreshed in your inner soul. And then at the end of the passage today, in verse 42, the villagers said to the woman who had encountered Jesus, we don't believe any longer because of what you've told us, but we've heard for ourselves. We know this man is the saviour of the world. So we make space to encounter Jesus, but we also make space and time to serve him, to share our experience of the living water with others who may be thirsty. As I finish, some words written by Richard Blanchard. Maybe you can use this as a prayer before you come to communion. Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. And then I heard my Saviour speaking, draw from my well that never shall run dry. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up, and make me whole. Amen.